Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session for Amazon Elasticash called Caching, Turbocharging Your Application Workloads. My name is Damon LaKyle, and I'm joined by my teammate, Zach Gardner. And today we're going to talk about how you can really improve the performance of your applications. First, we'll start off by talking about some in-memory data store fundamentals, why the uh, in-memory data stores are different than disk-based databases. And then we'll talk about caching concepts about how we take those fundamentals and apply them in terms of caching, and then it'll start to make a little bit more sense. Once it makes a little more sense, we'll actually show you a demo of caching in progress, both from before caching and after implementing caching. And I think you'll really find that very interesting. And then we'll talk about the two different uh, data loading patterns. One is lazy loading, and that's actually what we're going to be displaying in the demo. And I'll also show you some code samples for both Amazon RDS as well as uh, Amazon S3. Then we'll go through the write through pattern and we're actually gonna show you some pseudo code examples for that. And then we're talking about the actual Elasticash for Redis service. And then finally, we'll talk about some best practices before we close out with Q&A. So to start with the fundamentals. So fundamentally, in-memory data stores are quite a bit different than disk-based databases. And I've got a quick table here to show you just so you can gather some of the highlights here. Clearly the biggest and obvious difference here is that disk-based databases primarily rely on disk. Makes a lot of sense. And this also means that reads and writes typically incur a read or write penalty in terms of latency because you're actually going through more mechanisms on the system, right? In memory systems, they're designed from the start, from the very beginning, to be exclusively operated in memory. So you can do a lot more things, including data structures, which I'll talk to you about in a second. And because disks have an inherent latency built in, it doesn't really matter how fast the engine can push information out if, if it can't find the information, right? So the disk is actually what causes a good portion of the latency with disk-based databases. And so you're typically looking at single, double, maybe even triple digit milliseconds when it comes to disk-based databases sometimes. Whereas in memory databases, we're talking microseconds for the engine to respond. Now we haven't included the network latency on either one of these. So we're just talking about the engine latency itself. Now, typically there is a, also a performance bottleneck with disks because there's only so much information you can push through. Even if you find it quickly on a disk, there's a certain limitation you hit when you're pushing data from disk across the network. So whichever one's going to be faster is going to be kind of the, the throughput limiter, right? So the disk itself is gonna be slower so it can't push any faster. Whereas with in-memory data stores, surprisingly, it's not memory that's actually the performance bottleneck, it's actually network. Because you can actually push information out much faster from memory and across the network than you can from disk across the network. So when you combine those two things together, the millisecond latency, along with the disk throughput uh, performance on disk-based databases, typically you're, you end up with kind of a moderate, maybe moderate to high throughput, whereas in-memory data stores are really more on the high to very high throughput level. And then finally, the data models are quite a bit different as well. With disk-based databases, you typically have like, I wouldn't say forced models, but you have very strongly suggested patterns, right? Like normalized data with relational databases. Um, whereas with in-memory data stores, you have more like rich data structures. You have strings, you have lists, hashes, sorted sets, and so on. And so I'll show you some examples of what you can do with that in a little bit. So why do those traits matter? And why are we talking today? The important part for the business is the impact of performance. So why does performance matter? So in a 2017 Akamai study, they found that just a 10th of a second delay, so 100 milliseconds in website load time can hurt conversion rates by 7%. A two second delay can actually increase the bounce rate by over 100%. And that's pretty significant. Maybe this chart helps a little bit as well. There was a study on businessnewsdaily.com where if a customer had to wait more than a few seconds, what ended up happening is 90% of those customers would leave the website, about 57% purchased from a competitor, and 25% of the visitors never came back. And that's pretty important, right? We're not in the world anymore where people want to wait more than a second or maybe a couple of seconds. And if you have to wait, there's always someone else out there that would take that business. You know, we need to encourage our customers and we need to build our customers 
and we need to make sure that we service them properly. And that means very fast response times. That means high customer satisfaction. And that's what's driving the need for speed. We want to make sure our customers are happy with our service. And I don't know of a single customer that is happy when things are slow. So in memory data stores like both Redis and Memcached for ElastiCache, they're very, very fast. This is the first reason why in memory data stores are very, very good. They're just simply fast like we talked about earlier. Memory throughput is 50 times faster than SSDs at least. It's also predictable, meaning there's not a latency when you access the keys. It's a key-based index, basically memory pointers. And so you, when you reference a key, you automatically get sent to the data, data that you're looking for. There's no disk seek time. And so we actually have customers where a single millisecond can actually impact the value of their service. And so they need to control that at the microsecond level. And that's why we say microseconds is the new milliseconds. And it's a pretty bold claim. Uh, and I think we're going to back that up during this presentation. I think you'll see why. OK, caching concepts. So we'll start off with a few basics. And you'll get an idea of what caching is about if you don't know already. Uh, but it'll help solidify it in your mind, I think, uh, paint a few pictures for you. Uh, and then we'll go through a demo. OK, so the challenge with caching, or the challenge that we're trying to solve, is that we want to improve query read performance. We want to make sure that our clients or our applications get the data they need very fast, or as fast as possible, so customers don't have to wait. We'll take this example. Let's say we have an Amazon EC2 instance. It could also be Lambda uh, or anything, actually. And we're trying to access, let's say, Amazon RDS. So normally, we would make writes to that system, which, of course, would be written to the disk, uh, probably incur some type of latency penalty again. And then we read from it, which also means we probably read from disk, especially if it's a unique query and hasn't been cached in the buffer cache yet. And so as time goes on, more reads, more writes happen. And both of those workloads are kind of competing against each other. You have them competing for network resources and CPU and memory and disk access. And so really, if there was a way to offload some of that workload to a sub millisecond access service, that makes a lot of sense. And that's where Amazon ElastiCache comes in. So again, ElastiCache is written so that all data is pushed and written from memory. So anytime we read from a source data store like RDS, we would take that data. We would then write it into ElastiCache. So let's say we do a SQL query and we get the results back. We could push those results into ElastiCache. And then when possible, we would try to do our reads from ElastiCache first before going to RDS. And this gives us immediate responses, like sub-millisecond response time. It also gives us pressure relief from the backend services, right? You're relieving some of the pressure so that what you can do is either add new workloads onto that existing service, maybe you scale back in terms of size, uh, or whatever you, th you feel like doing, right? The, the thing is, we give you options at this point. If you have that same response in sub-millisecond, you get the same, same information. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to get it from in memory than from the source data store. Now, there are things we'll talk about a little bit later, like time to live, the, the risk of stale data, things like that. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. Let's take the same concept and we'll kind of step out a few thousand feet so you can kind of see it from a higher perspective. So again, EC2 or Lambda, it's reading and writing information to RDS. But we're not limited to RDS. We can actually use something like Amazon S3. So as an example, let's say you have objects out there that you want to cache. And why would you want to cache them, right? Well, S3 is a fantastic service, you know, long-term data storage. At, and what it does is provide this uh, across the board, uh, across all these regions. You know, you can uh, have all your information available to you depending on your policies. The thing is that Amazon S3 sometimes has throughput, right, limitations. Sometimes it has access fees. And so what if you could reduce those access fees you could improve the latency and store those uh, those objects in Amazon ElastiCache. Well, that's what you can do. But you're not limited to RDS or even Amazon S3. You're not really limited to anything in terms of querying, right? If your application can query a service or a database or an API, uh, you can definitely cache that information, especially if you're familiar with like serializing objects. And we actually have two or three different labs on our website with code samples that actually talk about how to cache RDS and S3. And I'll show you some code samples here, too. Uh, 
Okay, so how does this look in the real world? Um, we'll take a really simple example of just a website. <clears throat> so if you've ever been to a website, right, that is somewhat slow, we just talked about slow websites and how they can impact things. Well, whenever you go to a website, it has to render that page and that page is comprised of several different sections. Could be a header, could be recommendations that were built for you from an AI or ML system. It could be trending products that are built every maybe 60 minutes or something. Uh, main content for like either blogs or items to be purchased. And then again, at the bottom, you probably have some type of footer with social media links, et cetera. So all of these sections on the website usually call back to some service on the back end, whether it's a database, multiple databases, microservices, the file system, uh, it doesn't really matter. All these things are going back to something to fulfill that request to render that page. So those, all of those systems are are getting additional pressure whenever someone goes to this web page, right? So if you've got 10,000 people go to the web page and you reload it, and let's say most of the information doesn't change from you know refresh to refresh, especially for the same user, it doesn't make sense to go back to the original data source and query that original data source to see if things have changed. What would be what would usually make more sense is to have some type of caching mechanism like Amazon Elasticache in there. Then what you do is you only update the information in Elasticache when it changes on the data source. So like the headers and footers, if those only change maybe once a month or something, or once a week even, there's no reason to have you hitting the database 100,000 times a day to get that information. Same with the content, same with the recommendations. And all of these can have different time to live values as well. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to have everything in kind of one bucket and one standard approach. This is more efficient and more cost effective by approaching it with this. Okay, one of the reasons that Redis specifically is very powerful and very fast and provides a lot of use cases is its unique data structures. So if we take an Elasticache for Redis node and we look at it, we see that it has a number of different data types available to us or data structures. And the goal is to have essentially the, uh, to access those uh, data structures in a way that benefits other clients. So as an example, if we've got thousands of clients, they all have sub millisecond access to this Redis node. Let's say that client in the upper left is going to do a query and it needs to get a count of some sort, right? So it goes out to the database, does a count. Let's say the value is one. So we'll just set the value of A is equal to one. It writes that out to the Redis uh, node. And then now all of the other clients can access that information because the first client did all the work. The benefit here clearly is that subsequent queries are much, much faster. You're relieving the pressure from the database that we just talked about. And now all of your clients here are consistent across the board. They don't all have different values. Now, this is a really simple example, of course, because we're only setting the value of A to one. But what you would normally see is maybe the SQL string that you ran replaces the A, right? That's like a unique key name. And the one would be replaced by all the query results. And we'll talk about how to do that in a little bit. Now, again, there are several different data types available specifically in Redis. What we'll talk about today are the string and the hash primarily. And those are used, I would say, predominantly uh, as the caching types, preferred caching types. But the other data types are all very useful and can be used for caching. Uh, they're also used for things like message queues. They're also used for like joining sets together for geospatial queries, et cetera. Uh, but they can certainly be used in specific caching use cases as well. But again, today we'll just talk about strings and hashes. So we'll give you a couple examples of the different uh, data types and what they can when they can be used and what they can be used for. So a hash is just like it sounds. It's like a list of key value pairs. So it's similar to like a Java hash map or a Python dict or dictionary uh, or maybe like a database row as well. So here you see an example Redis command h get all or hash get all. Uh, then you see the key name and then you can see it alternates between key name and value inside of that key. So a string is very interesting. It can be up to 512 megabytes in size and it's binary safe. And that means you could literally take an image like a binary image, JPEG or what have you, and put it into the string data type and it would save it byte for byte. There's no escapes, there's no problems with you know encoding. You actually will get back what you put back in or what you put in. So as an example, if we were to do just get and then the key name, what you see here is kind of like a serialized uh, version of an object, maybe a query result or something. And then when you pull that into your application, it would just convert depending on how you convert serialization to deserialized uh, objects. Sorted sets are super fun to work with actually because they're very, very fast. Um, they're very good for leaderboards. 
but also for caching as well, because here you can see something like this, where you're kind of caching information on a regular basis. You're kind of calculating information too, where you're, maybe you're accessing information, you're adding the item count every time somebody orders something from a certain zip code. And inside of here, what we can do is in a sorted set, we can list these uh, zip codes by order, like the top three zip codes based off of the number of products shipped or something like that. And since this is a unique query or a unique data type, uh, this access is, you know, in like sub-millisecond response time. Uh, it's very, very flexible. And then finally, what we'll talk about is the set, which is similar to sorted set in that it's unique information, um, but it isn't ordered. So you can actually do things in here, like you can take multiple sets and merge them. You can, like with a union, you can uh, find the differences between them, uh, kind of similar to a join from a relational database. But again, we're not going to go into a lot of these. I just want to give you kind of a sampling of the different commands and the, and the different data structures available. But from this point on, we'll talk about specifically for caching and how to use these. So now what we'll do is we'll jump over to a demo uh, with Zach Gardner, my teammate, and he's going to show you how caching actually works in a demo. And then we'll be back and we'll continue with the presentation. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Damon, for that introduction. As mentioned, my name is Zach Gardner. I'm a senior solutions architect within the database specialist organization here at AWS. And today I'm going to be showing a brief demo around the use of database caching. And in order for us to visualize and understand the impact that database caching used with Amazon Elasticache can have on the performance and throughput of your applications, I've constructed just a small test harness to play around with different settings and configurations that come up when we're talking to customers around caching strategies. So few options here, we have set cache TTL. This refers to how long any data you write to the in-memory cache will, will stay there. And this is in terms of number of milliseconds. And then I have a few separate options for one, the number of different queries. So you can imagine as you write these unique queries to the in-memory data store, they will be populated for future retrieval. The larger number of different queries will increase the key size and uh, less number of different queries would have fewer keys. So this refers to how much in-memory storage you're planning to put in your cache because more keys will consume more memory. And next is number of calls. So this is really a great way to understand how fast the data will be processed through an in-memory cache compared to uh, maybe a disk-based uh, RDS database like MySQL. And then finally, query complexity. So when you think about queries that get executed in a database environment. Some are very quick and easy, and, and we'll call this low complexity, and then others are a bit longer running. They might perform some more sophisticated SQL that takes more resources to create and compute and return back to the client. So we have a few knobs for uh, query complexity, low, medium, and high. And finally, the only database I have for my test harness here is MySQL. But if you're interested in seeing a scenario like this for another AWS database, by all means, let us know and we'll be happy to prioritize that. And then finally, I have some metrics here around cache performance. So a few things we can analyze. One is the cache hit ratio. This refers to any time my application calls into the cache for data, which is being stored, it can serve it directly out of the cache rather than going back in a cache miss to the database to refetch the data. And the TTL will, will definitely drive that. And then the throughput. So Amazon Elastic Cache commands per second. We're using very minimal resources here, and this is not meant to be a performance benchmark of either Elastic Cache or RDS. Just shows a bit of the discrepancy in terms of accessing data from an in-memory data store like Elastic Cache and then similarly retrieving the queries from RDS MySQL. Again, not a performance benchmark, uh, apples to apples, just a, a point of reference. And then the progress, how fast did we get through the uh, through this, this simulation? So I'll run a quick one here. We have a TTL of five seconds and we'll store 500 different queries and we'll do this 5,000 times with low complexity queries. So I run that and we see the cache hit ratio is, is starting to increase as items are stored in the cache. And we see the elastic cache commands per second. This is the, the throughput, if you will, for that specific node to be able to process the data from in-memory storage. 
and this is inclusive of any network latency and there are definitely optimizations you can take to reduce that in your application, but this is just a quick point of reference. And we see it's a low complexity query. So the database, uh, our MySQL database was able to serve this out at a pretty good clip around 1200 queries per second. And we got through that test pretty fast. So what I'll do next is maybe up the settings a little bit. So I'll do a thousand different queries. I'll store the results for 20 seconds and we'll do again 5,000 total calls. But this time we'll run a medium complexity query. So this is all subjective of course, but if a low complexity query was just fetching a few columns, a, a single select star where ID equals as an example, maybe a medium complexity is running some functions or some aggregations. So we'll run it again. And again, we see the cache hit ratio is very low to begin with as the cache warms up. But over time, as these items are written to the cache, you can see that the, the performance is starting to go faster and faster because fewer items need to be retrieved from the database. And since we're running more complex SQL, we can see the database queries per second in this example happen to be much lower than taking the pre-computed data directly from in memory. So again, you're starting to see the performance benefits really start to, to add up. And then we'll run one more here, and this will be with a very high complex query rate. And let's, run, let's move this back because it might take a little bit longer to run these queries. We'll do 2,000 different queries, or sorry, 200 different queries, and then same number of calls, 5,000. So again, we see the, the database processing these complex queries around 24 per second, and Elasticache, again, performing consistently because the data doesn't need to be recomputed. And in our case, the cache hit ratio warms up and increases as the workload processes through. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea as far as the benefits of of how you can process data from your in-memory cache and how that can improve the performance of your workload and the throughput of your workload. So thank you so much for, for sitting through this presentation. It was really great getting a chance to, to show this with you. And if you're interested in learning more about the caching uh, use case, you know, stick around and Damon will, will finish up here. So thank you. Very cool. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, that's an amazing demo. It really shows the power of caching. Uh, and that can be applied, again, not just a, rela a relational database like Zach was showing, but across the board, across any service or even NoSQL database as well. OK, talking about patterns, um, there's two primary patterns. And actually, lazy loading is the primary pattern we actually see most of the time. Uh, but we'll talk about both. Now, Zach's demo actually showed the lazy loading pattern. Uh, and we'll talk about the benefits of that, too. But how does it actually work? So if we take a similar diagram like we saw earlier, and we have our clients, we also have a source data store here, it's RDS, and then we also have Redis. What we do is follow a very simple kind of three-step process. First, every time we want to get information, we're going to try to attempt to read from the cache first. The benefit here is that if it's in the cache, then we proceed in sub-millisecond response time, and our application just continues, right? It's blazing fast. There's no hiccup. You just keep going. It's really, really quick. If it's not in the cache, then it's considered a cache miss. And if you hit a cache miss, it's one of probably three reasons. Uh, usually it's the query was never sent before in the past, and so it didn't have a chance to cache that information. Uh, or maybe the information that was cached maybe timed out, right? You'll want to have stale data inside of your cache. And the other reason is maybe the system ran out of memory and it had to make room for newer information, so it had to evict that. So it could be a number of reasons why the information's not there. But for whatever reason, if it's not there, then we go to the source data store and we read from that. Now what we can do is get the original information and we know it's you know recent. And the third step we do is we, before we send it back to the client, we write it right back into Redis. So the next time we read from the cache, hopefully it's going to be there. There's some advantages to this. There's also some disadvantages. So we'll talk about each. The advantages is you're avoiding writing information into the cache that's not being used. You know automatically because information is there, it's been queried. So even if you're not ever going to see that query again, you know you've run it in the past. So it's not unnecessary. It's information that has a good chance of being queried again. You can populate the cache really at any time. You can actually implement this type of pattern at any time that you want because it doesn't rely on the cache to be pre-populated. It's going to populate it as it goes along and you get an immediate benefit from it. You don't need to, again, not just pre-populate it, um, but this could immediately go down 
Um, and as soon as it comes back up, it will start filling up again. So you don't have to wait for, let's say, somebody to make a change to data. All you need to do is be reading the data, and the data is going to be populated into the cache. Some disadvantages is that that initial cache miss uh, when you first try to read from Redis or uh, yeah, from Redis or Memcached or some type of caching system. When you go back to the original data source, it might actually cause a bit of an expensive uh, query. So expensive in terms of time, right? Even if it's a few milliseconds or worst case, maybe a few seconds, depending on the, the database or the system you're, ac you're accessing. And when customers are waiting for something, that's what they're going to see. They're going to see that delay in reading something that they want to see. That's a little bit that's a little bit different than a write latency, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then, of course, there's always that freshness factor. So you want to make sure that the data in the cache is appropriately timed to be available for your systems and not stale. So you don't want information up there that's going to be um, wrong, essentially, if you know your customers are looking for something and it presents the wrong information. Um, there's uh, there's ways to handle that, and we'll talk about those as well. Now here's a kind of a pseudocode example, uh, how to implement lazy loading. So if we were to take something like this, which is a SQL string, it's fairly simple, right? We're just getting a couple of, looks like columns from a couple of tables, and we're kind of doing a bit of a join or we're uh, basically doing a where clause. The thing here is we can actually take this SQL string and we, we could run it against the database. And so to store it back into Redis, we can actually take the key uh, and we can assign the actual SQL string to be the key name. So that would be a really long key name, but that's fine. Uh, like I said, strings can have values of 512 megs, but the keys can also be 512 megs as well. We don't recommend that, but it is possible. So if we were to take that key and we set it to be the SQL string, we can then take the value and serialize it. Again, this could be thousands of result sets. It doesn't matter. We can also use a hash map. might be more efficient, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but what you see here is just basically kind of very basic pattern. Um, but that key name is pretty long, right? I think it's about 140, yeah, 140 bytes. Uh, what we can do is we can take that SQL string and we can convert it into kind of a MD5 hash. And that gives us back like a 32 byte kind of unique string. And that's much smaller and more compact than that 140 bytes. So that's like 32 bytes. So that is that's actually comes into play when you talk about designing clusters and how much memory you're going to use. It's not uncommon where keys are actually take a significant portion of memory compared to the value. And we'll talk about that in the best practices section as well. All right, let's go through a code sample. Now, uh, this is this is actually code that could work, you know, assuming you have the plumbing around this in terms of the other uh, functions that are called here. So let's step through this code sample and I'll talk to you about each of those steps we talked about before. So first we're going to do is we're going to take the SQL string that was just sent. So if we if we name the uh, method or function called fetch and we pass it the SQL string, normally we would accept we would expect the fetch function to return the results, uh, whatever it is. But our fetch function is first going to check the cache first and then handle everything that we talked about earlier, those three steps. First thing we do is we take that SQL string and we convert it to that MD5 hash like we talked about before. Then we query Redis. So you can see step one, read from cache. We're saying here, we're saying the Redis object, uh, go get the key. And if it's not none, meaning if it actually does have a value, what we're going to do is we're going to convert it back into, you know, Python pickle object or whatever the original object was. And then we're going to send it back to whatever called it. And that's probably, again, sub millisecond response time. If it doesn't find it, it's a cache miss. So we're going to go to this branch. We're going to actually query the relational database in this uh, code sample. And then we're going to take step three, which is write that information right back into Redis. And you can see here we're doing uh, a redis.setx, which is actually a set expiration. We pass it the key name, which again is that MD5 hash. We pass it a TTL, which it could be 30 seconds or 30 hours or whatever have you. And then we convert the actual value uh, with Python pickle and we uh, push it out as a string or a serialized string into Redis. And so the next time we go through this, we'll actually see uh, that we hit the actual cache. And that's what will actually happen if we uh, rerun this. Now, the nice thing about this pattern is that it doesn't really matter if it's a simple query um, like you see on the right, where we're just getting like a single count from a table. And it could be essentially that equals like one row, you know, one column of one row because it's just a simple entry, like let's say 200, like you have 200 rows or something in users. Uh, it doesn't matter if that's what the query is. 
Or if it's something like this, where you're getting multiple columns from multiple rows, you could have 100 columns over 10,000 rows. Uh, this approach is still going to work because what you're doing is you're taking the results, serializing them, and putting pushing them into Redis. You're not doing any type of complex conversion uh, in terms of you know, changing ints or varchars or something into different fields for Redis. You're just serializing the information and pushing it back into Redis. Now, again, there is a better way to do this if you have very large query results, um, but we're not going to dive deep into that because we're just kind of touching the surface level of caching today. Let's talk about an actual caching example with some real code, not just pseudo code. So what you see here is just a kind of a snippet of code that actually does work. Now, it doesn't have all the plumbing, but it will work as long as everything's set up properly, right? So what we're doing here is we're going to take that same exact step, and we're going to apply it to RDS. And we're going to do step one, which is we're going to query the cache. So we're setting the name value to whatever the key name is inside of Redis. And that key, again, is that MD5 hash. Step two is let's, you know, uh, we actually missed it, right? So what we're going to do, say if value is none, we're going to go out to the actual source data store. We're going to run that query. And then again, we're going to push it right back into Redis uh, with this. So the next time we come through this, we're actually going to hit the cache rather than um, RDS in this example. So the same thing happens with, again, we talked about S3 before. So Amazon S3, again, um, uh, we have you know object storage. Uh, and what we can do with this is decrease our latency and we can improve throughput and you know even uh, improve uh, the cost associated with it. And here's a code example for that. So we'll follow that same pattern. So step one is to query the cache. So here, the key name is not an MD5 hash of the SQL string. It's just the bucket name followed by a colon uh, followed by the S3 object name or object key. So what we do is we query uh, the cache. And if it's, uh, if it's a miss, then we go out to S3 and we get the object. And then we extract the body of the object and we assign it to the data variable. And then we push that out into Redis with the set command. And the first parameter you see here is the bucket name followed by a colon followed by the object key. And again, that's the key name. And the, the key value will actually be the data or the object itself from S3. So you can see in both of these examples, it's really simple in terms of uh, the principles. Now, there is more plumbing that you'd have to put in here, right? You don't see any types of uh, checks in terms of uh, exceptions or try catch or anything like that. So there is some additional plumbing, of course, you have to put in here. And the more sophisticated you want your caching to be, of course, it's going to be more complex in here. If you don't want to just push it to a string, then you are going to have to iterate like through the different result sets and push them into different objects. But you can get started, especially with very simple caching, just like this. All right, let's talk about the write-through pattern, which is um, it seems almost diametrically opposed to the uh, lazy loading pattern. We'll talk about the differences here. So an example of a write-through cache. This is where it's kind of the opposite of lazy loading. And what I mean by that is that instead of the cache populating when you read the data, you're actually populating it when you write the data or when data changes. So the first step is always to write to the source. And the cool thing about writing to something like Amazon DynamoDB is that it can trigger a stream or a change, which then calls something like an AWS lam or a Lambda function. It can take some parameters, maybe whatever the information was that changed or whatever it is that you want to update, let's say a session store or something. It can take that information and then push it directly into Amazon Elastic Ash for Redis. Now, you can see this is a very simple procedure. That's a one, two, three. And once you write that Lambda function, that's really all you have to do. You don't have to implement uh, this logic inside of your client. You just implement it essentially inside of Lambda. And so some of the benefits here are that the information that's stored in the cache is never stale. Because as you write data, it's sent into ElastiCache. Now, I don't mean stale as in very quick to be updated. I just mean if the information's there, it's accurate. There will be some type of latency when you write to Dynamo and then not into Dynamo directly, but the time between Dynamo triggering something into Lambda and Lambda pushing it in, you know, there's no guarantee in how long that's going to take, whether it's milliseconds or more. Um, but you know that the data, when it does arrive in Redis, is going to be accurate. And again, we talked earlier about customers not wanting to wait for the information they, they want to see. And Write latency is a different type of beast compared to read latency because that can actually happen asynchronously in the background. So if a customer makes a change on a website, that information is submitted, let's say, to Dynamo, uh, and the customer moves on, right? All that can happen asynchronously, and the customer doesn't notice it. But when a customer is waiting for a query to run, they have to wait for that information to come back. So this is why sometimes it makes more sense to write into a cache 
And then you can read from a cache later for different purposes, but this is actually a different pattern to populate the cache. So some of the disadvantages here, um, you know, you can actually end up in two ways. You can actually end up pushing a bunch of data into a last cache that you're never actually going to be reading. Um, so depending on the type of information that's going in, right? Whereas with lazy loading, if you run a query and you cache it, you know at least once that it's been queried and it's likely or probable it's gonna be queried again. With this, you may not you may not be able to tell if it's ever going to be queried. Your logic says, go ahead and push it into Redis, but you're not sure if you're actually gonna use it. The other side of that is that unless data changes, theoretically, your last cache for Redis cache could be empty, right? You're not populating it unless something changes. So it's a different approach to this. And then finally, this is a delayed uh, benefit rather than immediate. Again, it only changes when something, uh, it only updates when something changes. Uh, and if nothing changes, then again, this is gonna be a very long delayed uh, benefit for customers. Now that was an example for a system that automatically pushed changes like Amazon Dyna DynamoDB. So if we have a system that doesn't do that or any other system, if we wanted to implement it through more manual per, uh, way, we can do that too. It's very simple, right? Whatever you do, whenever you write something to let's say Amazon RDS, you then just simply write it right into the cache as well. I mean, it's a pretty obvious and straightforward approach. Uh, nothing magic there, has all the same advantages and disadvantages of the previous one. And we'll show you an example here in a second. Now let's say we have something like, um, not just a session store, but maybe it's something like we have users inside of a database or we have users uh, inside of ElastiCache and we want to access their information really quickly. If we were to take something like a hash and we store it in Redis, uh, as you can see at the top, we have the key name, which is user ID colon Mike, and the key value pairs inside, you can see the keys are in uh, orange and the values are in blue to the right. Now, this is a, a really good example of using write through cache, um, and I'll, I'll show you why. So if we take this kind of pseudo code example, let's say a customer updates the location where they're at, there's some kind of button on the website or something, uh, and all it needs is the user's uh, ID and the location they're moving to. So we call this function, let's call it update function, we pass in those two values. The first thing we do, and again, this is going to be more of a manual thing like you saw just on the last slide, is we update the relational database. You can see we generate the SQL, uh, we commit whatever the SQL is, and then we immediately push it out to Redis. The difference here is that we're actually using a hash rather than a string. And it's important to know be because we are not just storing the entire new object or a result set, we're only updating parts of the information in the object itself in Redis. And that's important for both performance, latency, and the amount of information sending over the network. So the first parameter we send it is the key name, which you can see we just do user ID colon plus the value of the name, which is the key name at the top highlighted in red up on the left. The second thing is we pass it the actual key inside of uh, the, the, the parent key, which is location. And then finally, we pass it in the actual new location, which is DFW here. And it's as simple as that. And of course, this is, again, uh, not an exhaustive example. Um, there's no checks in here like try catch. It's, you know, it's missing some plumbing. But this is the concept of how you might want to use a write through for. Uh, if we were to look at it from a Redis perspective and went to the command line, we could do the same thing by calling h set user ID colon mic and then location DFW. And so the, you can what you can see here and glean from this is that the command inside of Redis is very similar to the command being called inside of Python or Java or whatever, or what have you, because you're actually using an API rather than a query language. And so that means you call the command name and you pass it parameters. And what you're seeing here is the Redis CLI, which is actually a way to interact um, with the Redis protocol. So if we were to do a get an H get all of user ID colon Mike, again, we see all the new updated information. And keep in mind when we change the updated location, we didn't update the entire object we just updated that, DF, that DFW portion of the object inside of cache. Okay, I'm gonna list a couple, um, actually all the major differences here of lazy loading and write through. I'm not gonna go through all of them though. Um, and I, you can you know, go back and watch this or download the slides, but the key here is that, which one do you choose? Well, lazy loading is usually the one that you can get the most bang for your buck kind of thing, right? You can get an immediate benefit and you can implement it rather quickly. But if you like the advantage of write through, there's nothing wrong with going with that. So which one do you which one do you choose? Well, you don't really have to choose either one. You can start maybe with lazy loading and implement write through to supplement it, uh, or vice versa. Typically, it's a little bit easier to start with lazy loading and you get the benefit immediately, like I mentioned. Um, but if you implemented both of these, you really have a fast, um, powerful caching system 
kind of the best of both worlds, right? You're, you're getting the information when it's being queried, but you're also populating it so you don't have to worry about that stale data. Now we'll talk about Elast Cache for Redis the service and some of the features it provides. So with Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis, we know that you have more important things to do than to administer Redis. So we provide this fully managed service where we manage the hardware setup, software, we monitor it for you, we create backups, we can offer to restore them for you. We have all sorts of features that basically remove that undifferentiated heavy lifting that you don't want or need to do. We also provide extreme performance, whether it's with Redis or Memcached inside of Elasticache. The sub millisecond response time combined with the ability to scale horizontally can get you millions of operations per second. It's highly scalable. So specifically with Amazon Elasticache for Redis, you can actually scale out to 500 nodes. And why would you want to do that? Well, there are certain use cases where you have to have a massive amount of memory, but you also need maximum network throughput. So in aggregate, you could have 500 nodes worth of network throughput for your clients. And then we're also compatible, of course, right? So with Redis, you, whether, whatever version is from 2.x out to 6.x, whichever one we support, uh, it's fully compatible with your clients. All you need to do typically is to change the, the access string to connect. And you have to make sure that you're using a cluster enabled client if you connect with the clustered version of Elastic Cache for Redis. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit as well. Now let's start off. Um, so from this point on, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about Elastic Cache for Redis. Why it's um, you know the remaining slides are going to be more about features, um, but the community aspect of it is important because you want to be able to not just take our word for it, right? You want to be able to kind of go out there and talk to people. Well, in this year, I think since 2014, actually, uh, DBEngines.com has ranked Redis as the most popular key value store since 2014, that's what's seven years now, seven years in a row. And this year, Stack Overflow named it the most loved database for the fourth year in a row. And this means it's most likely to be used by developers again and again in the future, and not just if they like it now. Personally, I know that people use it because it's fast, it's versatile because of all the different data structures, and the way you can access it through the API, because the API, again, is very programmatic-like. So if you're using Python and you're familiar with dictionaries or Java, familiar with hash maps, it's very similar to that. You create the object and then you just send it over to Redis. You don't have to worry about a lot of the conversions. You don't have to you know, iterate through a lot of the objects. And there is examples out there where you, when you actually modify an object out on Redis, you're actually modifying it at the server level. You don't have to go out, fetch the results from the server, bring it back, manipulate them and push them back over. You can actually tell Redis to update information on the server and it'll do it for you. So you're avoiding a lot of network as well. So there's a number of reasons why people love this, but mostly because it's fast and versatile. Now, how does Elastic Cache for Redis scale uh, for performance purposes? Well, we scale in a number of ways, both horizontally and vertically, but we're going to talk specifically more about reads and writes in terms of horizontal scaling today. So if we were to take our clients, and we know that they're reading and writing to and from the network, and they're sending their writes to the primary. They could also be sending their reads, uh, and it makes sense sometimes to send your reads to the primary. I'll talk about it in a sec. Uh, so when you send a write to a primary, what happens is it asynchronously replicates its information to some optional re replicas. So for each primary you have, you can have from one to five optional read replicas. What you see here is just two. And this, uh, this basic unit is what we kind of call a shard. Uh, the benefit of something like this is that you can actually expand your read capacity by adding replicas to that primary. So here we have two, but if we were to have five replicas, you're essentially increasing your you know, performance or your capacity to read by that amount. So the benefit here, again, is you write to the primary, it, it replicates its data, and then based off the number of replicas you have, it increases your read capacity. Now, how do you handle uh, scaling writes? Well, essentially, you take that same concept and you add more shards to the cluster. So now, instead of having all of your data in one shard, you have, well, at least in this example, you have about a third of your data in each shard. And that means only requests for certain keys are going to certain shards. So essentially what you get is you get increased network, increased memory, increased CPU, uh, aggregate across the entire cluster. And so this really perform, or this provides a way to increase performance and you can incrementally increase your shard count. You don't have to double it or triple it every time. And when you're done using it, you can actually shrink back in, you can scale back in uh, when you don't need that extra capacity, which is really nice. Now, high availability is something we want for something that is important for our customers, right? We want to be able to uh, 
have as much reliability as we can for the service that we're providing. So with Elasticash for Redis, let's take an example of how we might deploy it. If you're to take a region, let's say with three availability zones, and you deployed a Redis cluster, by default, what we'll do is we'll deploy a primary into one of the uh, availability zones, and we'll deploy its replicas across other availability zones. The reason we do this is because should that primary go down or should the unlikely event occur when you can't access an, an entire availability zone, one of the other availability zones and that replica can be promoted uh, to take the rights. So let's look at an example. So if we take this information and we're replicating it across, um, we, we get that basically consistency, right? So we can fail over if we need to. Now, this also helps in terms of when you do maintenance, you know, when you upgrade, you know, versions of Redis or when there's uh, things you need to change on it and needs to do like a rolling upgrade of some sort. This is how we would handle it because the data is replicated across these availability zones. Now, this is kind of a single cluster example. If we were to have multiple clusters, you can see here it has, let's say, from zero to 5,000. Those are the hash slots. And there's about 16,000 hash slots in Redis. So this is about a third of the data. So if we were to take that cluster we saw on the last screen with basically three shards, this would be the first shard. Now, when we deploy the second shard, we're going to take the primary and we're going to place it in an availability zone different from the, from the first primary. And it's going to be responsible for a different set of keys or hash slots. And, it's going to and we're going to deploy its replicas across the other availability zones. So as you can see, as we grow, as we add yet another shard, and that contains you know, the, the last third or so of the data, uh, and it replicates its uh, data across AZs, what you see is that we really take availability into account by default. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that your service is reliable for your customers. And so again, in this instance, should any uh, node fail or be replaced for some reason, whether planned or unplanned, uh, or should an availability zone become unavailable for some reason, uh, you, we still have the ability to access all of our data and we can read 100% of our data. And only if um, only for a short amount of time would data be unavailable to be written to in a specific shard. So for example, if that orange shard in the upper left uh, were to become unavailable, uh, only about a third of the data would be unable to be written to for a very short amount of period of time. We're talking seconds. Um, you know, so, and, and then when it comes back online, you can write to it again, but at no time do you lose access to reads because you can read from replicas in this point. Okay, and the, the last thing I wanna talk about related to caching and really related to almost any use case with Elastic Cache for Redis is something called Global Data Store. And what this does is it provides a fully managed, fast, reliable, and secure cross-region replication service for Elastic Cache for Redis. What that means is you basically take a cluster and it can be designated as a primary or an active cluster, and it will replicate its data to up to two other secondary or uh, what we would call replica clusters across the globe. So wherever this is supported, uh, you can implement it. And we typically see about a, a one second delay in terms of latency uh, when you replicate it. So the two benefits here are you can use it for both disaster recovery purposes, where you can promote one region to be the primary uh, and demote one to be the replica. Uh, but it also provides very low latency reads for all the clients in those other geographies for your customers as well. So we'll close out with some best practices and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So for best practices, there are actually a lot of best practices for, uh, for pretty much any system. Uh, so we can't go into all of them, but for Elasticash for Redis and in-memory data stores in general, uh, a lot of these apply. So there's something called an eviction policy. We call it a max memory policy inside of Elasticash. And what it does is it controls how Redis behaves essentially when it runs out of memory or when you exhaust memory. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these different ones, but depending on what it is that you need, it can evict information based off of the last time that the information was referenced or how frequently it's referenced. You can have it uh, evict keys that only have a time to live set to them. You can make it random. Uh, there's a bunch of different you know, things here. The key here is that thinking about your workload, that's gonna help you determine what policy that you're going to select. Also, cluster isolation is an important aspect here too. If you have different uh, clusters or you have different use cases, that have different um, time to live values or eviction policy uh, behavior that you want, you would want to deploy a separate cluster for that workload because there's essentially one policy per cluster. Now time to live, I promise we'd talk about this. Uh, this is to help us essentially get rid of data that we think might stay around for too long, right? We don't want to have information uh, stored around longer than it's going to be uh, changing on the back end. So if it changes every five minutes on the back end, you don't want to cache it for 24 hours. Uh, you want to have an appropriate time to live value. 
So we want to assign that, uh, especially that essentially that freshness factor to each and every key. Now in Redis, there is not a default uh, time to live. So whenever you write a key or whenever you want to update it, or even after the fact, you can change the TTL, but it won't do it for you. So the other thing is that you can assign these not just during creation and modification. Uh, you can actually do it after the fact, like I mentioned, but a lot of the commands you can run actually have a parameter where you can actually send the TTL in it. So you don't have to do it after the fact, and you don't have to send like a second uh, request or a second command to do it. Also consider that some keys probably shouldn't have a time to live because they might contain like reference data uh, or, inf or configuration data, something like that. So when you maybe uh, boot up your applications, maybe they go out to Redis and they read some information that helps them bootstrap themselves. Or maybe it contains information like different objects are related to each other, but there's an object in there that you want to uh, always stick around. You don't want a time to live on that. You, you want to be able to reference that data. You don't want to lose that referential integrity essentially when you're manually implementing it with Redis. You also want to set the TTL dep uh, depending on what it is that you're doing. So if you just want queries to be um, expired after five minutes or something, you can do that. Or you can set it for a fixed time. Like I want this query to uh, stay around to the end of the month, right? At midnight or something. And then it, the last part about this is you also want to apply some type of random jitter to the TTL. And what I mean by that is that if you were to, let's say, submit 10,000 query results uh, and all of them are a different key into Redis, when the cycle comes around to evict keys, um, you don't want it running too long on, a, you know, on all these keys that might have the same TTL. Redis is very fast and it tries not to block when it can, uh, but there are some procedures in the engine that will block. And so when you can, you want to help it by adding this random jitter. So because Redis does things, you know, essentially on the, at the microsecond level. And so when it does all these different operations, it has pretty fine tuned control uh, of when it uh, executes these internal processes and mechanisms inside of its own engine. Uh, so we're just trying to give it a little bit of help here. So key naming is important because not just for organization, but also when we talk about, uh, we have a feature that I'm not going into right now, but it's called role-based access control. And so that part of that equation is how you name your keys. So as an example, uh, not only does it help for organizing it, but here you can see like the blue aspect of it, the, the blue key name, app one, colon string, colon customer, colon one. So in this example, it might be that first part might be the application name or the application unique identifier. Maybe the second part of that field is the object type that you're referencing. Uh, because if you list the keys and you kind of want to get an idea of what a certain key is, uh, it'd be helpful just to include it in that uh, in the object name. There are ways to get that information otherwise, but it might be helpful to include this as well. Uh, the customer aspect, maybe that's just um, you know either the customer name uh, and then finally the unique identifier at the end. So in this, you can see the result is just a serialized object that it's pulling back. Now, the other option is, again, that MD5 hash that we talked about the same result set could be stored, but just with a different key name like this. So if you don't know, let's say the app naming pattern or the key naming pattern, like you know, it is this app X with a string and the customer and a unique ID, let's just say it's query matching. Uh, this is fine to implement it like this. At least signs, assign something like the application name, uh, what the function of the, or what the purpose of that key is along with the MD5 hash string. And you can see it's the same exact uh, result set actually. And keep in mind that those key names do take up memory, um, but you want to make sure that you spend enough uh, memory on the key name to understand its purpose and uniqueness, but not any longer than that. And then finally, uh, best practices for clients. So here we've got quite a few. Now these apply um, not just to um, Elasticash for Redis for cluster mode, but also non-cluster mode uh, for the most part. So connections are important. I mean, you know, if you don't have a good connection or a fast connection, that really is going to impact uh, the performance of the application. Connection pooling is actually going to help you reduce the overhead on the CPU for both the client and the server. So you can have a certain connection being reused by different aspects of your client. Uh, and so that helps avoid you know, the building up and the tearing down of connections on both ends. When you do reconnect, uh, make sure to implement some type of exponential back off, kind of like the jitter we talked about for TTLs. Uh, but for every time you try to reconnect, you don't want this process where Let's say um, you have some type of, you, let's say you shut down all of your applications and you bring them all back up at the same time and you have 30,000 clients all connecting at the same time. Um, that doesn't work too well because you know they'll all try to get to Redis, some of them will time out and then they all stop and they all try again at the same time again. So that's why you wanna use an exponential back off. So you allow some uh, connections to make connections, right? And then the other ones will connect after that. You wanna determine which connections uh, are reads and which ones are writes if you can.
So again, we talked earlier about reading uh, scalability and writing scalability and capacity. So when you want to do a read, ideally you want to read from a replica because it offloads that work from the primary. And you want to do that because the primary is taking all of the writes, but it's also replicating that data to its replicas. So it does have a pretty significant workload already. Uh, make sure you use the read only parameter when you do that. Otherwise, even uh, there are some commands that you can run that are read only commands, but they could still fail on a replica uh, if you don't specify that read only parameter. And then for non cluster mode or what we call cluster mode disabled versions of uh, Elasticash for Redis, we provide something called a reader endpoint, which makes it super simple to connect uh, to multiple read replicas and you don't have to worry about it. You just use the DNS name to connect to them. So performance, there's a few things you can do to increase the performance between the client and the server. Um, pipelines are really cool. It's not the same thing as connection pooling. Um, it, what it does is it allows you to send multiple, multiple commands um, before requesting a response from the server. So it really reduces that round trip time between the client and the server. So if you had a million records to load, maybe you wanted to upload them in batches of 10,000. And then only after you upload 10,000 do you want to get the result you know, from those 10,000 and then move on to the next ones. Because otherwise, after every upload of an object or a key, you're waiting for the response. And that really, you know, over the course of hundreds of thousands of requests, um, you could really significantly increase the time that you don't need to. You also want to use, uh, well, you have the option to use uh, to turn off specific replies uh, to, to your client. Uh, again, this is really helpful for uh, when you're doing like mass inserts. And then finally, the last point is to definitely use a client supported, or excuse me, a cluster supported client library um, for Elasticash for Redis cluster mode. And the cluster mode is what we talked about earlier when you had multiple shards. And that's typically the recommended and best practice approach is to use a horizontally scalable cluster mode version. Um, but to do that, you need to use one of the clients that supports cluster mode. Most of the major Redis clients do support that, but you know there are over 100 uh, different Redis clients, but most major languages have a Redis client that supports that. All right, with that being said, hopefully this uh, was very helpful. We're gonna jump over to the Q&A section now to take any questions you might have.